I'm a guy who pretends he knows better while constantly making reckless choices. I don't do drugs other than alcohol, but I won't pass judgment on anyone that's just my way. But then this happened. My circle of friends all used drugs and alcohol, and they invited me to a wild weekend-long party in the woods. Even though I don't indulge much, I thought it was the right time to join them. Everyone seemed happy and carefree at first, but something felt wrong. It was late fall in upstate New York forests, as far as you can see. The scenery was beautiful, but something felt eerie and ominous about the atmosphere. There are many wonderful places to camp. It is a haven for nature lovers. I got my truck ready. I'm six feet five and was about 230 pounds at the time. I first cleaned it and made it comfortable for sleeping in. I enjoy camping, but I detest lying on the ground. So I added two crib mattresses, three pillows, and two comforters to the back. I packed my coolers, one with food and the other with alcohol. After saying goodbye to my father, I left for the party. I like to arrive at events late because I don't mind working hard, but I didn't know if I was going to stay the entire time, so I wasn't going to set up everyone's supplies for them. The area in question was off the beaten path and down a dirt road. I was taken aback when I arrived at the open area after passing through a small open area of trees. Over 25 cars had to be parked there. I could see people sitting around a location to the right, starting a fire. I turned to the right and saw two grills going, cooking sausages and burgers. Sure enough, there was a guy cooking on both with a piece of meat in his mouth. I made a sour face and sighed. Past that was a projector set up to a temporary white screen. I was immediately hit in the face by a stench and a delicious smell at the same time, which was from a certain dank plant being smoked and sausages. I sighed as I dealt with my mentally disabled friends and their enjoyment of something I still don't understand. Oh well, here we go again. In any case, I didn't give a damn that a guy was trying to direct me where to park and backed up close to the fire. I grinned as I got out of the truck. I questioned, towering over him. You deserve a cold beer. He laughed and shook my hand, introducing himself. I don't feel like walking back and forth, and I'm not about to carry my cooler any farther than I have to. I gave him a beer, locked my truck, and went looking for my friend who had invited me there. I found him finishing up the construction of the projector screen, and I asked him what he planned to show. At that point, I realized I didn't know many of these people. My good man, play some music. He thought he was a ladies' man, and I played along with him. He starts some sort of music and lights up a cigarette, telling me that there will be a lot more people and that the weekend will be a blast. He smiled as he looked out at where I had parked, and I told him that I was only there for the ladies. I allowed myself a smoke. We both had a good laugh. Fast forward a few hours, and it's about 11.30 p.m. He said there was a good view and that fishing with the right kind of bait was also possible. I hadn't been particularly intrigued by any of the girls. I turned around to see a girl I hadn't seen before. She was chatting with the other people and joined a circle of people who were passing around joints. I'm picky and have a type for the future missus. I go back to my cooler and grab my Johnny Walker. Without even glancing at him, I approached my friend and said, Dude, who's the blonde girl? I asked him again, and after what seemed like five minutes, he turned to face me with an annoyed expression on his face. I consequently inquired about the blonde girl for the third time. He answered, I don't know, man. I gave him that look, and he began laughing. I told you a lot of people were coming. I asked him what he was gazing at when I realized he was doing it. 
In the woods, he claimed to have seen something, but it was probably just the fire playing with the shadows. Everyone was in a good mood, and the music was playing loudly. I shrugged it off and approached the young blonde woman. I greeted her and inquired about her name. She turned to face me and grinned. She was stunning, with long dirty blonde hair, icy blue eyes, and fair skin. She was sure to meet most of my requirements, which was awesome. I was so close to melting there. Wouldn't you like to know? She asked. Attitude. Yes, I was infatuated. We continued our conversation. But she was a little odd. She continued to stare off into space as we spoke. For someone who was high on a mind-altering substance, she kept up with the conversation perfectly. I was able to get her away from the group a few minutes earlier, but she stopped abruptly and moved back toward them, so I also joined the group. The group split into three separate units after another hour or so. The girl was content to join me on my tailgate but she continued to give me the 100-yard stare. My friend approached me and probed me about it. He informed me that she wasn't the only strange person who showed up. He nodded toward a man, but even in his mental state, he knew not to just point at someone. So I listened to him speak as I checked him out and kept an eye on him. He was strange, appeared homeless, spoke very little, and moved awkwardly. He had a vodka bottle in his right hand, which he would occasionally open and sip from. His clothes were filthy, and his jacket was worn and tattered. He kept mumbling something about needing to go potty. At this point, it was around 2 a.m. My friend said something about everyone using the restroom before he turned off all the lights, so they all left quickly, with the exception of the blonde girl. I joined her and told her that if she wanted, she could share the bed of my truck with me. She would have a pillow and bed all to herself. She grinned, pushed me to my back, and kissed me. She had been smoking and drinking all night, but she still had a sweet, smooth flavor that woke me up. I'll never forget that. She stated that some of the girls were returning to the tents. Don't leave the area. I'll return right away. She quickly rolled off of me in the tailgate, and I quickly got to my feet to check on her condition. Without even speaking, she started to move in the direction of the restrooms. She was leaving, turning back and giving me a wink. I grinned to myself as I noticed the strange man with the vodka bottle. About twenty feet behind her, he was moving in the direction of the restrooms. I was raised in the South and consider myself a gentleman. I observed that that man followed her. I didn't want anything to happen to her, so I went in the direction of the restrooms. I noticed blood all over the back row, which was closest to the trees and had been knocked over. The blood trail began in the fifth from the leftmost stall. The vodka bottle was there, whole and leading to the woods. The man's jacket was shredded in the trees with blood all over it, and there was hair all over. At this point, I was sweating and terrified. The smell of blood and a rotting smell filled my nose. It all happened very quickly. I resisted the urge to gag when I noticed that the man's arm was covered in hair and was no longer attached to his body. As I did so, a branch broke. Instantaneously. The flashlight moved in the direction of the commotion, and I could see what was left of the man's body. Not only that, but he was also missing an arm, a hand, his lower body, and his head. What was left of him was ripped into pieces. Then, what appeared to be a white, furry hand pierced his sternum, which is the best I can describe it. It was covered in a thick, nearly tar-like black goo. I quickly processed everything, and then it dawned on me that the cause of this was concealed behind his body. The creature had one puffy, 
watery, icy blue eye and one golden amber eye. The creature was wearing the same outfit as the blonde girl on which I had a crush on. Everything was illuminated by the LED flashlight I had. It was like some sort of revolting horror film, like some sort of bear tearing apart a robot if I were in a science fiction movie. The most important thing hit me just before the others were about 20 feet away. The man's body was thrown just as everyone was about 5 feet away from me, knocking me back into everyone. The following scene was one of chaos, yelling, throwing up, and running. I was pushing people out of my way so I could get to my truck. I grabbed Johnny and carried him and threw him in through the driver's side door because I was the only one who could make sense of it all. The moment I climbed inside, I heard the saddest howl I had ever heard come from the trees where that thing had vanished. It sounded like a mixture of sadness and longing. When my friend and I finally spoke, we were driving back to his house on the highway. He thanked me for getting him. That night, either of us slept and nobody brought it up. In the morning, we returned to retrieve my friend's vehicle and all of his belongings. Nothing there provided evidence for what happened the previous night. I have no idea what transpired that night because there was no sign of any activity, no blood on the ground, no body parts in the woods, and no torn clothing. When it comes to cryptids, I am no amateur. This was not some tale intended to keep you awake. It was my way of telling you about something that happened to me. Who were the blonde woman and the strange man in the jacket, whose torso was thrown at me and had hair all over his arms and smelled like feces and unwashed disgustingness? For the sake of sanity, perhaps that man was a skinwalker. I'm okay with saying that aloud, sure, fine. It was Harry, too and his blood was more like a thick black goo. There was also human-like red blood on the ground, too, by the porta potties What about the young blonde girl, though? They were pursuing one another. The more I considered what had happened that evening, the more I understood that she had been looking at him the entire time, not off into space. Women typically go to the restroom in groups for safety and girl talk, so she deliberated until the other girls started to return from the restrooms before approaching them. But what could harm a skinwalker in that way? I've read some pretty spooky things about them. I don't know what to say other than that someone might have died that night if she hadn't been there. Skinwalkers are being hunted in northern New York. And I think dogmen are doing it. It was 2016, and a full moon loomed in the sky as Michael and I trekked deep into the woods at the edge of our rural Ohio town. Coyotes howled and circled around us, sending shivers down our spines as we watched cat videos on YouTube from underneath our tent. Suddenly, a long silence descended over the woods, interrupted only by the sound of heavy sniffs just outside our tent flap. Our hearts raced as an oversized human-like hand slowly slipped through the tent entrance before us, revealing two startlingly blue eyes that stared directly at us with a menacing glint. Our hearts stopped as we were paralyzed with fear. We just sit there, unsure of what we could possibly do. Unexpectedly, it starts to creep under the tent. I'm not sure why it was trying so hard the entire time to get under it. It was also growling ferociously. My friend took the hammer we had been using to drive the tent stakes, and all of a sudden, he begins to strike the object where he thought the head was. This creature growled instead of yelping like a dog would. And worse, it had a demonic sound. We repeatedly struck it before running as quickly as we could through the tent opening, across an acre of yard, and through the door to my garage. 
I could see this enormous shadow following closely behind us every time I turned to look behind us. I barely registered the black shape lurking in the shadows at first. It was so dark, like a living void that swallowed us whole. My heart raced as I recalled the legends of this cursed place and its eerie occupants. Then it moved towards us in a canine-like motion. Still, its hand held aloft in an unmistakably human shape explosive terror surged through my veins. Was this a skinwalker? The creature's eyes glinted with inhuman intelligence. It didn't look like a person, but whatever it was, I never wanted to set foot in those woods again. Let me begin by stating that Grand Portage is one of the most remote areas in Minnesota, located at the northernmost point of the state. It has an approximate population of 800 and is on the shores of Lake Superior. The county seat of Cook County is undoubtedly a very beautiful hamlet. Surrounded by thick pine trees and running streams, it has some of the best hunting and fishing spots on the lake which serve as the family swimming pool in the summer. I live in a decently sized house. My father built it before I was born with his bare hands, using only hand tools. You can go on daily hikes through the picturesque woods or swim in the lake, which serves as our swimming pool. At times during winter, we can see the northern lights, which always keeps my family and me awake when they appear. My husband works for one of the biggest electric companies in Minneapolis. We've been married for 12 years now, and together we have two children, his son from his first marriage and my daughter from mine. He has never taken another mistress, nor will he ever do so, because he still loves me even after everything that's happened. Basically, I'm a 30-year-old mother of two who also has a husband. My husband occasionally goes hunting and fishing in these woods and has shown me all the paths there. I didn't feel threatened as I followed the path into the dense forest. As I previously mentioned, I had been thoroughly instructed on these paths, so I knew them like the back of my hand. As I walked, I occasionally spotted rabbits and fat squirrels. I was fortunate enough to catch a glimpse of a doe and her fawn as the sky grew darker. I suddenly realized that all the sounds in the woods had stopped as I walked deeper into them. No insects were chirping. There were also moose in these woods, and since these woods connected with Portage State Park, I was sure there were hundreds of them. I was perplexed, but when I would go on hunting trips with my husband— he explained that it was because a predator was close, coyotes, wolves, and the occasional bear. I suddenly heard a creepy sound. I had never heard anything like that in my years of existence. No animal in these woods is capable of making a sound like that. Not even one of those screech owls. Immediately after that, I smelled decay, like rotting flesh and fish. I choked as I cupped my fingers over my nose. I realized there must have been a very decayed animal nearby. All of a sudden, I heard soft footsteps approaching from the left. I turned to look, but there was nothing to be seen. The footsteps got louder over time, so I started to run but fell over a piece of bark. My thirteen-year-old son was calling me from the right just behind a few large oak trees, and it was the next sound I would never forget. Mommy! Mom, are you there? Come on over. I've got something cool. I scrunched up my face in perplexity. My son was in bed at this time of night, so he was obviously not out here. In addition, he wouldn't come out here by himself. The voice kept repeating the same thing without altering its tone or pace. It was my son's voice, but it was also completely strange. He would easily become lost or injured in these woods. 
I was terrified as it appeared that someone had recorded his voice and played it back with static. As I stood up, the entity that had been speaking in my son's voice emerged from behind one of the oak trees. It was slightly taller than me at eight feet. It was also lanky. The creature had a hideous face. I had never before seen anything with such intensely dark eyes, and I knew those two eyes were fixed on me. It had a huge mouth but no nose. It had white patches on its light gray skin. Its arms and legs were eerily thin, but for some reason, it seemed powerful and very evil. It had no hair on its head, and I could see ribs poking out from its sides. It made a sudden motion that I can only describe as a smile, a grin. This smile had jagged white teeth, and it made me feel as though one hundred cold fronts were passing over my body. The creature's mouth stretched wider and wider covering its face from ear to ear. Then came the unbelievable. It spoke in my daughter's voice. Mommy, it's cold. Fear coursed through me as I sprinted towards home, screaming for somebody to help me. The thing followed me, its footsteps pounding like thunder, and its breath rasping like steel wool over rock. Its shrieks were ear-splitting and echoed off the trees, but I never looked back. As I neared the clearing, I couldn't hear the footsteps anymore, so I ran even faster to get up the porch steps. When my husband saw me slam the door shut and lock it behind me, he saw terror written across my face. The shades on every window were lowered, and I had to take a few deep breaths before speaking again. That night my husband also admitted hearing shrieks coming from deeper in the woods while hunting. He never told me about the sounds because he thought that his mind was playing tricks on him, and he believed that creature was either a wendigo or a rake. We obviously didn't tell anyone about the creature. We didn't want to be called crazies. Now, every day, my husband's hunting rifle is always near me, just in case something ever comes too close. The forest near my home in Chatsworth, New Jersey had always been a special place to me. Five years ago, when I was twenty, I enjoyed going there with friends and even alone, but this particular day was one I would never forget. After two hours of eating and playing video games at my house, Adrian, Mark, and I got into my truck and headed for the woods. It was a joyous occasion filled with jokes and laughter as we drove towards the wilderness. We saw snakes, deer, and a rabbit as we got closer to our destination. When we reached our camping spot, I chose to pitch my tent in a small clearing right by a small creek, while Adrian and Mark were nearby, only a minute's walk away. Unfortunately, after a full day of playing outdoors, we were too exhausted to make it back to the area that we were supposed to have set up camp in. Panic started to creep into my mind as I thought about what might happen if anyone found out we were here. I wish I could have maintained that same good mood, but fate had other plans. I fell asleep at around 1.15 and slept until I was awakened by the sounds of splashing and twigs snapping outside at 4 in the morning. Outside, it was still dark. I felt uneasy right away. I speculated that it was a black bear. Bears can generally be very dangerous. When I finally had the courage to look outside, I noticed something. It was a girl, and she was drinking from the creek, but there was something strange about her. She had black patches that appeared to be skin. Initially, I assumed it was because she was mangy or even slightly deformed but after observing how composed she appeared, I changed my mind. Then, in a flash, it turned to face me and let out this bizarre sound that sounded like a hybrid of a goat's bleeding and a bat's chittering. After that, it unfurled these strange black patches, 
which I later realized were wings similar to bat wings, and it started to fly. I screamed like a baby and ran to wake up Adrian and Mark from their nap. Anxiety and confusion were written all over my face as I awoke in the middle of the night to find Mark and Adrian giggling in the corner of my bedroom. Their laughter immediately turned to shock when they saw my expression and instructed them to leave without further explanation. As we ran towards my truck, I kept looking behind me in fear convinced I would see something chasing us. The whole ride back home was silent, until finally Mark asked what had happened. Too scared to believe me, he and Adrian continued to insist that my experience could have been just a dream or an illusion. But I knew better than that. That morning, I decided to search for some answers on the internet, trying desperately to make sense of what I had seen during that dark night deep into the woods of Chatsworth. All my searches pointed out to one possible answer, one that sent a chill down my spine. Perhaps I had encountered the notorious Jersey Devil. Until this day, they still think I imagined it all. At the time, I was 18 years old and a resident of Nevada. The snow-covered winter of 2017 brought us to the local reservation for some serious rodeo practice. My brother's horse, George's horse and my own were all in the competition, but mine usually spooked over the slightest thing, making it an uphill battle throughout the day. But as the sun began to set, and we decided to take a trail ride into the nearby wilderness. Everything seemed to have calmed down. Out of nowhere, however, came an unmistakable stench that can only be described as being that of rotting flesh. We squinted into the darkness and saw a collection of dead animals strewn across the tree line. Immediately our horses became startled again and started prancing around uneasily their eyes darting nervously in every direction. Naturally, my horse steadfastly refused to move forward. We all decided to call it a day because we were exhausted from the long day and frustrated by the horse's lack of cooperation. Since it was already too late to load our equipment and horses and take them home, we decided it would be best to leave them there for the night and stay with George since he lived closer than my brother and I. After some good food, good laughs, and a few games of pool, we went to one of George's family friends who offered to cook us dinner. After dinner, we all wanted to go to bed, but I wanted to check on the horses one last time. When I mentioned this, George's family friend cautioned me that it was a bad idea to go out there alone at night. Wanting to respect that, George offered to go with me. I looked out the window and noticed two bright yellow eyes peering in our direction. They were glowing, despite the absence of any light source near them. When George asked what was wrong, I asked him if he can see that monstrous yellow-eyed creature glaring back at us. He said that he can't see anything. Am I crazy? I'm starting to see things? Although I'm usually a calm person, something in my gut told me this wasn't right. Nothing alive around here could be big enough for those eyes. I felt froze in fear as I tried to comprehend what was watching us from outside. I started to think it must have been my tired mind playing tricks on me, so I quickly stepped on the gas and took us straight back to the arena. When we arrived, my horse hadn't touched her food which is extremely unusual for her, and neither had the other two horses. After getting home safe and cold, exhaustion overcame us soon after we settled in bed. But before long I was jolted awake by my brother yanking my arm and shaking me, telling me to wake up. It was 2.15 a.m. I hadn't told him about our encounter at the bridge, and I wasn't going to tell him now just to scare him even more. Trying to be reasonable, I told him to just ignore it and try to get some sleep. 
He put his finger over his mouth and pointed to the window. I heard a tapping on the glass and an eerie scratching sound. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. In the morning I woke up George and my brother so we could go get our horses and head home, because I didn't want my poor girl to be out there with that thing any longer, whatever that was. I was convinced it was the thing from the reservation. What I saw last night was real, and it had followed us back. After our coffee, George and I ventured out to the darkened window to search for signs of the tapping and scratching I'd heard. To my absolute horror, the tracks were not those of a regular deer there was only one set of hooves pressing into the earth. Without delay, we quickly gathered our belongings and raced back across the bridge. Standing in the tree line was an enormous buck with a huge rack, bent and broken legs, and skin that appeared to be decaying from its bones but what made me wretch was its face. Yellow eyes that seemed to follow us as if they were looking straight into my soul. It flashed a sinister smile at me before disappearing. We got ourselves away from there as soon as possible I'm certain it had returned to give us one last frightful goodbye. I know I'll never step foot in this place again. The dense forest of southern Oregon beckoned me to explore its beauty when I came here at sixteen. My biological father had moved us to a small, two-bedroom house on forty-three acres of land with the Siskiyou National Forest bounding our property. The winding dirt road that led us there revealed the thousands of abandoned logging roads that blanketed the area in a thick canopy of trees. An elderly couple lived at the start of our driveway and invited us to hunt and explore the land as much as we wanted. They only asked that we stay away from the blocked logging road stretching up the mountainside to our west, an invitation that filled my mind with curiosity and dread. With each step I took off my front porch, I knew I was venturing into a realm of unknown danger. At this point, I had been residing with my father for about two months. I distinctly recall enjoying having the weekend off from school. Together with my dad's twelve-month-old German shepherd, Rex, I would saunter through the dense forest. I'd even stayed overnight a few times with Rex. I made the decision to go camping again that night, so I packed my pack with everything I need for the trip. My dad who was reluctant to let me camp alone, reluctantly agreed, only asking that I take the hunting rifle with me. Black bears and wolves are rare around here, but I understood his concern and agreed. Around 7 p.m. that evening, I said my goodbyes and left with Rex. I never went too far and only camped in areas I had scouted, because I was still new to the area. I set out in the direction of the west after recalling a cute little clearing there. About thirty minutes later, I arrived at the crescent-shaped clearing. I sat my pack down and started gathering large rocks and fallen brush for the fire pit because the clearing's center was about thirty feet wide, which was more than enough space for my one-man tent and a small fire pit. About thirty minutes later, I had my tent set up and a small fire going. Rex and I were roasting hot dogs on a big three-pronged fork in the darkness. All of a sudden I noticed Rex's ears perked up. Rex was standing on all fours and gazing directly into the shadowy woods behind us. He hadn't quite mastered patience or the dangers of the woods, so I wasn't surprised when I heard rustling in the underbrush and saw Rex run off in pursuit of the sounds. I got up and called him back. He wasn't complying with my orders. I started to feel anxious. I was aware that in order to find him, I would have to leave camp. I put my boots on, snatched my flashlight, and slung my rifle over my shoulder, aiming it in Rex's direction. I whistled after calling his name, and then paused to listen for a moment for any sounds that might have him nearby. 
I continued walking because all I could hear were crickets and frogs because I knew I had to find him. If something happened to his dog, my dad would be devastated. When I first noticed deep tire marks in the ground, I was about 40 yards from the camp. I've seen an old man that two months ago told us about an abandoned logging road that led up to the beginning of the property. I decided to follow the small truck trail in the hopes that Rex had gone that way. After about 17 minutes of walking, the thick forest began to open up. The moonlight was bright, so I didn't need my flashlight to see. A truck-length dirt road was blocked by a small gate. As the road rose, it revealed a tall mountain. I stood at the gate and called for Rex again. Rex came from the top of the road after I waited for about ten seconds. Boy, come back here. That's when I noticed I heard it. Boy, come back here. Someone was mocking me, repeating the same line. Boy, come back here. I was frozen in place, my hands sweating, and my body trembling as it slowly crawled down from the tree line that bordered the road on all fours. It was about seven feet tall, with long, slender limbs. It stood with a hunched back and turned its small head towards me. I spun around as I heard something snap in the crisp night air, my heart pounding as I laid eyes on the creature. Its large frame loomed over us, its menacing yellow eyes fixed on mine. At that moment Rex and I started to run like our life depended on it. We headed directly back home. I survived that night, but I can't shake off the feeling that whatever had been stalking us was still out there in the shadows of the Siskiyou National Forest. When I was 22, I ventured deep into the heart of Brazil's Amazon rainforest. My best friends Greg and William accompanied me on this dangerous escapade that our wealthy parents funded. With a few hired guides to aid us, we felt invincible. Our journey from Texas was grueling, lasting an entire day due to layovers and time differences. We were sleep-deprived and anxious for what lay ahead. When we finally landed in Rio de Janeiro, we snapped a few pictures while descending from above but there was no time for sightseeing. Our taxi driver didn't speak English, so we had to rely on an outdated map to guide him through winding roads that led deeper into the jungle. Our main guide Eugene awaited us in a remote village far from civilization. The air was thick with humidity and tension as we embarked on our perilous adventure. We knew that danger lurked around every corner, yet we pressed on with relentless determination. The anticipation of coming face to face with nature's raw power kept us alert even when fatigue threatened to overtake us. As soon as we arrived at our destination, I knew instinctively that this journey would push us to our limits physically, mentally, and emotionally. The thrill of testing ourselves against Mother Nature sparked an intense fire within me that refused to be quenched. And so began our epic trek through the untamed wilderness. Eugene was a fascinating character, about 45 years old, with brown hair and blue eyes. The car ride itself took another hour. The three of us shook his hand one at a time. Eugene spoke in broken English but it wasn't so bad that we couldn't understand him. He seemed like the type who didn't put up with crap and had the most serious expression on his face. He gradually warmed up to us and became accustomed to us. He had planned to take us far into the rainforest, to some lagoons and the Amazon River. We were in the village, which name I won't disclose, in a small, quiet area where everyone was warm and friendly. We were hoping to see some large snakes and other strange animals. The next morning, Greg shook me awake, telling William and me to get our lazy asses up. Minutes later Eugene came in, and we went with him to his family. 
Eugene's family welcomed us and gave us rooms for the night. We had a delicious meal of beans and rice along with some very delicious chicken, followed by some sweets. This lagoon was small, and when we got out of the car, insects and birds welcomed us. The three of us were getting a little rowdy with excitement because we were spending two nights with the tribe, which is a friendly one. However, Eugene told us to pay close attention to him and said that we were spending two nights with the tribe. I answered, Well, at least they're friendly. But aren't there some remote, hostile tribes here? Eugene gave me a response. If you choose to go a little exploring, do not venture too far from the village. You must remain nearby. Most importantly, keep your head down when we're on the river. William and Greg laughed at this. Eugene said, My own friend went too far from the village on the river and was never seen again. I noticed that Greg's and William's faces had also grown darker and got a chill. We looked at each other. We were surprised by the tribe people's appearance when we arrived at the village. They had tattoos and nose rings. I was aware that this could be dangerous, but deep down, I was still excited and determined to show it. Others wore masks. We got to the boat, and soon we were speeding down the Amazon. The scenery was amazing. We even saw a jaguar staring at us through the trees. We saw alligators swimming through the water. Eugene pointed toward the water a short while later, and we almost dropped our cameras. In the water, a huge anaconda was gliding. We were stunned. In less than twenty minutes, we saw the main Amazonian predators. This place really was as wild as you would imagine. This particular snake was easily 1,900 pounds and must have been over 20 feet long if not 25 feet. It gradually submerged beneath the water. Then, everything went wrong. All of a sudden, Eugene appeared terrified. The three of us weren't ready to leave, and he started to try to turn the boat around with a terrified look in his eyes. Eugene said, Boys, be quiet. There's a risky situation here. I believed him because of the way he said it. Observing Eugene behave in such a way made me want to leave as well because he still appeared to be upset. I wanted to have fun, and right now, it was the complete opposite. As I was contemplating this, I noticed something I hadn't before. The surrounding rainforest fell silent. Greg and William were the first to notice it. Eugene was breathing heavily for some reason as they all turned to look around. Suddenly, from out of the rainforest, we heard many tribe villagers yelling at us to come back. They looked very scared. Eugene, please come back. It's risky to stay there. Eugene frantically attempted to turn the boat around, but it was stuck as a growling voice appeared to boom all around us. We were unable to leave. I was close to crying. The worst part was that there might be tribes out here that could harm or even kill us. We were far from the village, we didn't have any radios with us, and there was no signal for our phones. If I asked Eugene what was going on, Eugene replied in a trembling whisper. It wants to harm us. I mumbled. What wants to harm us, exactly? It's obvious that something doesn't want us here, and it could be dangerous. Eugene lowered himself into the boat and muttered. Some creature like your Bigfoot. I was aware of the Bigfoot legend. Everyone has heard of it. However... I was unaware of any reports of them possessing human-like voices. Eugene muttered that the creature detested having people in its domain, that we were considered outsiders, and that it would kill us if it got a hold of us. The natives were rumored to prey on these creatures, who were as tall as ten feet. All of us immediately turned toward the sound after hearing a loud splash in the water. There, I witnessed the most unsettling sight I had ever witnessed. 
a large, obtrusive object that resembled the American Bigfoot was wading through the water. Its mouth also had two enormous fangs that appeared to be about three inches long. Its massive arms gave the impression that it could easily rip you in half if it got a hold of you. This enormous, terrifying thing was headed straight for us. Greg and William were sobbing while Eugene yelled as he desperately tried to turn the boat in a hurry. With an unnatural scream, the creature swam toward the boat. It sank under the water when it was 19 feet away from the boat. I was positive that I would pass out. I sobbed and yelled at myself after that. The boat miraculously roared to life at that point, and we quickly departed. We quickly turned around to see the creature screaming as it rose above the water, nine feet away from our boat. Eugene barely uttered a word when we returned to the village. He immediately called for a taxi, and it arrived in short order. Everyone around us was scared and motionless. Eugene essentially shoved us into the car before hastily driving off with no intention of ever returning. The rest of our journey led us to Rio de Janeiro, so by the time we eventually made it home, we were still uneasy. Despite our enthusiastic stories about the trip, some of the incredible memories weren't good ones. If you plan to visit the Brazilian rainforest, just be mindful of your surroundings. It's an experience that will forever stay with us. I've been conflicted about this for a while. As a Navy SEAL, I feel obligated to do what is right to protect people, but I also need to make sure I don't go too far. Something happened to me that I'm not supposed to tell you about. I can, therefore, only describe what occurred to me without going into great detail about the procedure or mentioning any particular steps. To publish that online would be too dangerous. There's a threat out there that no one wants you to be aware of, and no one really knows how to deal with. There's a small island that no one really ever steps foot on. You never know who might hear it. One of our ships will occasionally pass it for various reasons. One day, as the ship passed, everything on board lost power. A team was dispatched to remove the Navy SEALs from the ship because it is a difficult place to access, and there is nothing of value there. They claimed that it appeared as though an EMP had been set off. We sent the A-team to the island to try and find out what was going on because we thought there might be an unauthorized person there. It was a fairly standard procedure. I was a member of the team sent to investigate the island. We were a small group, but we got along well. We searched the island but found it to be trickier than we had anticipated because none of our compasses worked properly. I recall that the air felt strange like it was both hot and cold against our skin at the same time. It was heavy, and I quickly ran out of breath, which is unusual for a Navy SEAL. However, we continued on and made the decision to start at one end of the island and thoroughly search the area before turning around and checking any areas that may have gone unchecked. We had traveled about two-thirds of the way across when we were in an area of dense trees when something felt off. I always had the feeling that someone was watching me, so I stopped and motioned for the other men to be quiet. I carefully searched the area but couldn't find anything. Then I turned to look up at the trees. I didn't initially see anything, but I was still aware of the eyes on me. Then, out of the tree, a large dog-like creature leaped, landing on all fours next to one of my teammates. It was almost at his eye level. The animal, which was at least seven feet tall, stood up on its hind legs as soon as he stepped back and pointed his weapon at its head. We all had our weapons raised. The animal moved so quickly that it knocked my teammate to the ground before we realized it had happened. 
I fired my weapon because I couldn't afford to waste any more time. The animal screamed loudly when I shot it in the leg. The scream shook the surrounding area. My teammate decided to give it another shot, and this time the bullet went straight through the animal's head. The animal slumped to the ground, and we moved in for a closer look. It was unlike any animal I had ever seen. It had a dog's head, but its body was large and skinny, and its legs appeared to be abnormally long. It appeared to have cat claws on its paws rather than dog paws. One of my teammates then informed us that his compass had begun to function once more. We loaded the creature onto a portable stretcher that we had with us, and while the other half of the team finished searching the island for potential EMP devices or unwanted visitors, the other half of the team carried the creature back to the extraction point. Once the animal had been removed, a group of people was already waiting for us when we returned to base. Nobody brought up the incident again after the animal was put in a cage and taken away. But from what I understand, there was never another unusual occurrence on that island. According to what I understand, the animal's odd behavior and the vessel's power loss were caused by the animal. Its body somehow radiated a tremendous amount of power. I can't believe it's the only one of its kind— and I have no idea how it ended up on that island, but I do know that something like that is dangerous because I felt the shockwave when it screamed, and it passed through my chest. I'm a college sophomore and this place has a sizable bar scene. The norm around here is to go out for the evening to get discounted alcohol to get wasted with your friends. Despite this, I don't drink much because the taste is so unpleasant, hurting my stomach. However, I do enjoy the company and frequently go out with friends or to make new ones. I often get referred to as the group's father because I always look after them. That sets up what transpired when I decided to accompany them one Friday night. So, after getting ready, we had a little pre-game time at my friend Emma's place before taking an Uber downtown to one of our fairly well-known college bars or clubs. My friends immediately broke off into small groups after we entered the club to look around for girls they wanted to try their chance at spending the night with. Since one-night stands aren't really my thing, and I don't want to end up cock-blocking my friends, I usually find someone at the bar and make friends with them instead of looking for girls. I know this makes me sound strange. A girl eventually approached me as I was talking to a man wearing a cowboy hat. She was about five or six years old, had dirty blonde hair, and what I believe to be light brown eyes but they were so light they almost looked gold, which confused me a little. She offered to buy me drinks in exchange for being her friend for the evening, and I agreed because, after all, that's why I came here. Nevertheless, she kept her promise, and we got to talking. She introduced herself as Christina but asked that we call her Alex. I questioned her about some fundamental things like whether she traveled with friends or attended a local college, and all her responses were negative. That struck me as rather strange, considering how risky it is for a girl to be alone in the downtown area at one in the morning. However, she was interested in hearing about me and appeared eager. Since I typically learn about other people instead of the other way around, it felt like a nice pace change. Since I'm a pretty big lightweight, and, as I've already mentioned, I don't binge drink often, it could have also been the alcohol starting to take effect. She kept looking into my eyes the entire time I talked, and her warm smile made me feel acknowledged if that made any sense. She seemed to be having as much fun as I was, which made me even happier because I assumed it meant I had made a new friend. But that's when she started to act differently. 
she began to act flirtatiously and eventually asked if I wanted to accompany her home. I explained that I don't typically have one-night stands and prefer getting to know people a little better before having sex. She may have briefly expressed what I believed to be anger on her face, but it was quickly followed by another smile and her suggestion to stay at home and watch a movie. She grabbed my wrist and guided me outside. I nodded and reached for my phone to start ordering an Uber. She wouldn't respond when I asked if she intended to drive after drinking, which left me perplexed. When we eventually left the club, she pointed to a black Honda Civic parked in front of the establishment. At that point, every warning bell sounded like a tornado had just passed through. I had probably consumed six or seven drinks at this point in the evening. However, I was still sober enough to recognize the warning signs. She claimed to have arrived alone, but the parking space was in a pickup-only lane, and I never saw her call an Uber. Therefore, the car would have needed to be driven by someone. This made me uneasy, so I re-asked if she intended to operate the vehicle. She continued to lead me toward it and replied, Yes. As we drew nearer, I realized that was a blatant lie, and as I saw the silhouettes of the other three men in the car, my heart began to sink. I yanked my hand away from her and uttered, There is no way in hell I'm getting in that car with her. As my adrenaline began to rush, she tried pleading with me again, saying that she would let me do whatever I wanted, and that she wanted to have sex, but I had already turned around to head back to the club. I walked back up to the bouncers to enter, and she started swearing at me, practically screaming. We all regrouped and went home after I texted my friends to let them know what had happened. Clearly, she frequented college bars to get men inebriated before offering to sleep with them so she could put them in a car with three other men to rob them or engage in who knows what other criminal activity. I dialed the number for my city's anonymous tip line and left a thorough description of the girl, the car, and the scene. I'm so grateful that even though I was inebriated that night, I could still piece together what was happening before it was too late. That was a real wake-up call for me. Always be careful when going out with friends, particularly if it's late at night or if alcohol will be consumed. Back in 2007, I was leaving a buddy's house and headed home. He resided on Lake Ariel in Wayne County. I was 15 miles away, so I took back roads to save time and avoid cops. I spot a van off to the side, doors open, and lights on as I reach the top of this mountain road. Even though it is well past midnight, no one is driving. I slowed my car, a 1989 Volkswagen ragtop, down to first gear looking for a person or persons that may be hurt. The woods are quiet, and no one is in sight. The driver's door is open, but the van is not running, and all lights are on. I remember thinking, Shit, I have to call the police because I won't have cell service until I reach the top of the mountain. I then moved in the direction of where I knew I would have cell service a maximum speed of 30 miles per hour. I knew this situation was bad, but then it got worse. The roadside vegetation thinned out not more than three miles away, giving you a better view of what is in the woods. When I noticed movement, I let off the gas because I don't want to run over a deer. This man emerges from the tree lean and into the road as I release the brake. He is covered in fresh blood. He's so covered in gore I couldn't tell it was a man at first. He waved me down as he stumbled out in front of the car. I was obviously in my top-down ragtop. He was grabbing at my door and screaming. 
I jumped in first and launched myself. I had cell service for about another mile and called the police. The dude was hurt, and his grab for my door scared me. I decided to wait for the police in a roomy area on the mountain. In less than ten minutes, they arrived. I raised the top and locked the doors while I waited. An officer recorded my statement and used a torch to inspect my car. The woodsman's accomplice left a bloody stain on my door. A different officer located the van but could not find the man who emerged from the woods. The police told me to go home and promised to call if they needed anything else. I did receive a call a short while later informing me that the van had been found and asking me to describe the man. That evening, they failed to locate him. As far as I know, they never did. It appears that the van was stolen, and the police believe this man injured himself and fled in a panic. I'm not aware that they ever found him. I keep watching for a bloody man running out of the woods even today. This experience has stuck with me and is 100% true. My childhood best friend, Jessica, and I were around 16 years old at the time. Jessica's family would spend each summer living in their camper at their own campsite in a provincial park about two hours from our hometown. I could visit them this particular summer for a week, and we were eager to explore the forest. We decided to head down quickly to the ice cream shop by the lake before it closed on the last night I was there. Early evening, the sun shone brightly, but the light faded. We followed a path that descended a small slope right next to the main road, with about ten feet of dense vegetation and trees in between. The forest and additional tall, dense brush were on the opposite side. As a result, we continued to move forward without noticing any other pedestrians in our front or rear directions. We hear sudden branches snapping and rustling that sound like they could be a deer moving through the woods. If there hadn't been the sound of running feet after, I wouldn't have given it a second thought. After briefly glancing in the opposite direction, Jessica grabs my arm and beseeches me not to turn around. Likewise, the running comes to a stop. Why I didn't ignore her and take a look at myself is beyond me. I decided to listen because I could tell she was genuinely afraid. We both experienced that feeling of panic when you're frantically running up the stairs after turning out the light in the basement. Knowing the ice cream shop is now only a short distance away, we pick up the pace as much as possible without breaking into a sprint. We soon reach the parking lot after the path ends. Jessica directs me sharply to the left away from the ice cream shop and toward the lake and the boat rental. I follow her lead in silence, realizing that ice cream is no longer a current interest. At this point, Jessica's anxiety is obvious. While both of us are looking around, it appears that whatever scared her is out of sight. As she approaches the boat rental facility, we climb into the kayak that Jessica retrieves for us and we set off across the lake. She tells me that there was a man behind us when we started paddling and that the man abruptly stopped running toward us after making eye contact with her. She swore she saw him put something shiny away in his coat as he stopped running, even though it was the middle of July and he was wearing a long, black coat with the hood up. He also had a terrible smirk on his face. Given the noises we heard just before he ran out onto the path, it appeared that he had just come out of the bushes after we had passed. When we arrive at the lake center, we stop paddling. I take out my Nokia brick phone, which, thank God, my parents had given to me, just in case. Jessica receives it, and I instruct her to contact her parents to arrange a pickup. 
She starts to pale as she peers past me toward the shore. As the phone rings and raises a hand to indicate what she is observing. When I turned around, the man stared at us as he slowly walked around the path that encircled the lake. He completed two laps while keeping his eyes fixed on us from where we were sitting in the middle of the lake before finally vanishing. We were terrified the entire time as the sun grew lower and lower. It took several attempts to reach her family. Even though we were able to arrange for someone to bring the truck, it was already getting dark when we arrived at the shore. I'm not sure what we would have done if we hadn't been able to call for a ride. Looking back, I'm unsure why we didn't just go to the ice cream shop, tell the employee in charge, and request that her parents pick us up there. Fortunately, we returned safely and never ran into the man again. My name is Charlie. I grew up in the suburbs of Nebraska with conventionally conservative Christian parents. These suburbs surrounding geography is what makes them peculiar. For instance, my town is next to a long, straight road extending for miles. Behind the massive wall of trees that lines both sides are the swamps. Locals refer to the road as the Green Hallway due to its layout. A small mountain range, perfect for mountaineering and long hikes, can be found next to these trees. I'll never understand why God put mountains and swamps together. If he even exists, that is. I'm not here to think about whether God exists, though. I'm here to share how my life turned out for the worst. On a sleepy summer evening, it all began. I only lived a few miles away on the other side of the green hallway from my parents. They sent me a message and invited me over for dinner because we hadn't seen each other in a while. I agreed because I had nothing better to do that evening and didn't want to turn down a home-cooked meal. I now prefer to ride my bike to my parents' house whenever I visit because the green hallway is mostly empty, and I love being outside. I discovered that renting a bike from the neighborhood bike shop was simpler than buying one. I then went to get one for the lengthy trip to my parents' house. Mike was the owner's name. Nice guy who always appreciates patronage. He didn't even need to ask what I needed because I had often rented bikes from him. I listened to the radio he always had on while I waited for him to get the bike. But instead of music... I heard a woman delivering a PSA. Police are looking for a young woman named Sharon Kim who was reported missing recently. Her long black hair, brown eyes, and pale complexion are all described. Please let me know if you know anything about this woman's whereabouts. Mike interrupted as he rolled the bike over to me. Scary stuff, huh? Sure is, I replied particularly in a small community like ours. Mike chuckled. Amen, brother. Amen. So I set out on a bike trip down the green hallway that I had previously taken many times, putting aside thoughts of this missing girl. I've always enjoyed riding my bike that way. Feeling the wind on my face as I flew past the trees was thrilling. I thought I was flying through the air as the environment to my left and right blurred into a green color. Until life decides the ride is over, it was liberating, a sensational journey that made you forget all your problems. I didn't see the bump in the road because I was too focused on my ride, to put it another way. I was startled and made a sudden swerve to the right, which sent me and the bike careening off the road and into a tree trunk. Fortunately, I was wearing a helmet, so I wasn't hurt other than a few minor abrasions on my arms. I yelled aloud when I finally saw the bike. The impact had caused the front wheel to bend inward, rendering it useless. God damn it, Mike's going to put my head on a spike, I thought. 
I was so angry that I picked up the bike and started walking it down the green hallway to my parents' house. I reasoned that I had already traveled enough distance to be close to them. It turned out that I wasn't, and after a good ten minutes of walking, I realized there was still a good amount of road in front of me, stretching endlessly as an asphalt strip. I took out my phone and attempted to call my parents for assistance, but there was no reception. The sun was starting to set, and I was certain I was running late. I was about to resume my arduous journey when a faint rumbling broke the silence. As soon as I noticed the source, a massive RV, my eyes grew even wider with anticipation and hope. With my right arm extended and my left arm waving, I let go of the bike and yelled for the driver to slow down. Right next to me, the RV suddenly stopped, its enormous size making me feel like an ant. The driver emerged when the door opened. He was a big man with muscly arms who stood about six feet tall. For a redneck, he appeared to be in fairly good health. He was dressed in your standard plaid shirt and blue jeans ensemble, complete with a black trucker hat and combat boots. He had a scraggly beard and a light Febreze fragrance. He asked with a smile, How do you need a lift? You know it. I replied with a smile in return. I'll put your bike in the trunk if you just hand it to me. Anyhow, I need to fill up the tank. I gave him the crooked bike and entered the RV. The bedroom was located down a short hallway at the back of the house. The left side was lined with wooden drawers, and the top of the left side had a marble counter with a wooden cabinet hanging over it. A door leading to a bathroom or closet was next to the counter. A booth with a large window behind it and drawn curtains were to my right. The table was spotless, and the cushions appeared to be brand new. I was astounded by how tidy everything appeared. While waiting for the redneck to complete refueling the RV, I decided to use the restroom. When I opened the door next to the counter, I discovered a supply closet with plenty of water and emergency supplies. I entered the bedroom because I couldn't find any other doors and reason that the man wouldn't care if I used the restroom. To my left and right, respectively, were two doors. I quickly poked my head out of the RV and asked, Hey, uh, sir? I figured one was the bathroom but I didn't want to keep poking around the RV like no one's business. Do you mind if I use the restroom? I inquired after realizing I didn't know his name. Michael. Michael is my name, the redneck declared. Sure, there's no issue with that. Just turn your head toward the back, and the bedroom door is directly in front of you. Enter the space to access the restroom through the door on the left. I gave a nod before returning inside. As I entered the bedroom after returning, I could immediately smell Febreze. However, there was also something peculiar there. Almost sinister behavior. I gave up trying to identify it and just went in to finish what I had started. The smell permeated the air while I was in the RV's teeny bathroom. It started to smell revolting like something was going bad. The longer I was in there, the more overpowering it became. I became tenser and tenser. What the hell is that smell that Febreze has mixed with it? It has an animal decaying odor. My heart sank when I realized that what I was smelling was actually rotting flesh. I grew more frightened as I considered it more. I attempted to explain it away by saying that it was just my wild imagination or my senses playing a joke on me, but it was all too real. I imagined that there was a body buried somewhere in space. The first thing that came to mind was the door to the right of the bedroom entrance. I finished and went outside while still inhaling the smell. The smell of flowers combined with the overtones of rot at this point was intolerable. 
It seemed to get stronger as I approached the bedroom door. When the smell became intolerable, I had to find out where it came from. I leaned toward the door on the right and observed how the smells grew stronger the closer I got to the door. My peak curiosity eventually won over me. I jumped back in horror as I opened the door. Only a small, bloody cardboard box containing bones, internal organs, and flesh was inside. I was so shocked that I had to lean against the wall to catch my breath while looking at the detritus. It took all of my willpower to hold back the urge to vomit because my stomach felt like it had been double knotted. I prayed fervently to God that those remains did not belong to a person. Then I noticed a round object that appeared to be distorted. I focused on it, attempting to determine what it was. I could make out pale skin with blood stains on it with increasing intensity, and long black hair strands. As I thought back to the radio report, which stated that she was described as pale with brown eyes and long black hair, I felt the blood drain from my face, and my knees weaken. Long black hair and pale skin. Black hair that is long. In a cardboard box, I discovered Sharon Kim's decaying remains. I leaned over and, without even thinking, vomited into the box because I could not keep it down any longer. I started running, terrified, for the RV door but stopped myself. The redneck would probably try to kill me if he saw me running because he would know I had discovered the girl's remains. I collapsed onto the booth, panting and attempting to regain what little control I had left. I waited a short while before going outside and getting some fresh air, hoping the redneck wouldn't notice. He was still adding gas to the tank when I went outside, his sleeves rolled up. You almost finished there. Michael? I asked him, trying my hardest to keep my voice calm. Yes, I'm just about finished, so don't you worry, the redneck said. Okay, cool, I replied. I was leaning against the RV, still in shock from what I'd seen when I noticed a scar that extended from Michael's wrist down the length of his right forearm. Michael's eyes briefly swept over to me before settling on his wrist. I turned my head away, but he caught me. He then giggled. Oh, funny, he said. I'm sure you're wondering where this beauty came from. I could hear the trembling in my voice as I uttered. Yeah. Charlie, you need to calm down, or you'll reveal yourself. All right, I'll explain. You see, I used to enjoy hiking. I cherished climbing mountains. I recall frequently climbing those mountains there when I was roughly your age. I had a friend who would climb the mountains with me, he said, pointing to the mountain range west of the trees. I knew him my entire life. We were like brothers, he added with a smile. In our hikes, we always tried to push ourselves. We would constantly search for higher mountains than the ones we had just climbed. Years of doing this helped us develop into a pretty good team and even received some local recognition. Then, one day, we decided to attempt to climb Mount Navarro, which was beyond our comfort zones. The name immediately brought to mind one of the highest mountains nearby. It was given that name in honor of the first man to scale it. The task of scaling Navarro was difficult. I'd even heard of a few cases where people had perished due to misjudging the mountain's height, which made the air thinner and its weather. For Navarro, neither official tours nor camps were set up. We both felt up to the task because we have experienced heights. However, I had no idea what the hell I had gotten myself into. His tone abruptly changed from one of happiness to one that was much darker and slightly more acerbic. A storm hit while we were hiking. We quickly became disoriented as our vision became foggy. We both believed we would pass away. Our food was almost completely gone, and we were already at a high altitude. 
he slowed down. His eyes grew vacant, and his face hardened as if he were daydreaming. What happened? I gasped after a moment. He said, turning his glare to me. He lost it. My friend snapped. He lost it because of the thinner air, a lack of food, or something else that got into him. He attempted to kill me, most likely so he could consume me. My face was directly in front of the scar as he raised his arm and said, Clearly, that didn't happen, but he did get me with his knife. My mind was in a vice grip at this point. I'll never understand how I managed to stay composed at that moment. But seeing those girls' remains and hearing Michael's tale simultaneously was too much. It took every ounce of willpower I had to maintain my composure as I could feel myself perspiring, my heart racing, and my limbs trembling. I have no idea how I managed to do it, but I did. What happened to your friend? I inquired. I did what I had to, Michael said, his voice becoming angrier and his glare more intense. I murdered him. I knew I had to fight him after he stabbed me with the knife. So I took the knife out of his hands and stabbed him in the back as he made a fist and an outward stabbing motion in my direction. My mind screamed at me to run away from him as my heart dove into my stomach. But soon enough, I developed a taste for human meat. He got up, moved over to the drawer the furthest away from where I was sitting, and took out a meat cleaver that looked like it had just been sharpened and polished. Yet I was aware that it had been. And not long after that, I decided that I needed more. That phrase was the turning point for me. Before I knew what was happening, I was bursting out of the RV door and out of my seat, sprinting down the path. I was running so ferociously that it felt like I was competing for the gold medal in the 100-yard sprint at the Olympics. As I flew past everything in front of me, I could only hear my breathing and Michael catching up to me. His tall, heavy frame caught up to me with every second. I was barely able to think as I sprinted for my life. Then, from behind me, I heard a loud cry echo through the ominous sky and a faint thud. But I persisted. I did not turn around. I only heard it and paid no attention. I simply kept running. I skipped the trail's entrance while running. Toward the town, I ran down the street. I ran as fast as I could to my parents' house. When I arrived, I threw myself to the ground, gasping for air and sobbing as my parents did their best to comfort me as if I were a five-year-old who had just experienced a nightmare. A short while later, I was being questioned by the police inside the home. Still trembling and exhausted from what happened, I tried my best to answer their questions. From the time I first saw the RV, I told them the entire story that had happened. They informed me that Michael had passed away when they returned from the hiking trail where we had stopped. He had fallen on his cleaver after tripping over a tree root. The blade sliced his heart. But hearing this didn't really make me feel better. Even now, I can still clearly remember the expression in Michael's eyes as he looked into my soul and related his tale. It was a deranged, vacant look. I'd been seeking counseling for months to deal with this situation. Although I was doing much better than a few months ago, I was still shocked. I occasionally have nightmares in which Michael is chasing me. When an RV passes my house, I become uneasy. I didn't hitch again. But perhaps most significantly, I never again went through the green hallway. When I first moved to the small, rural town of Gorham, Maine, I had little idea what the town was like. I had heard that it was a lovely location that wasn't particularly well-liked, 
but the residents had been born and raised there for many years and had never left. It was the kind of town where everybody knew everyone else. Less than ten years prior, I had made the decision to relocate here. I'm now considered a regular in the group. But there were still some things I didn't know. In a group with this much intimacy and security, there are some secrets you don't go poking at, like the ones about the past. Oh yes, the past is a hot topic, when milk could be delivered or gas cost 50 cents per gallon. But in this small town, no one wants to be reminded of the past I'm talking about. Legends are frequently transmitted from mother to daughter and father to son. At parties, a cousin of a stranger and her daughter met. Even though disturbing rumors are spread, none of them can be true. In the game telephone, a word is passed around so frequently that, by the time it reaches its conclusion, it is entirely different from what it was at the beginning. Because this story has no conclusion, I'm writing it all down and telling it in the first place. I have no idea what happened, and I'm hoping someone, somewhere, can explain this absurd, childish, rumor-starting nonsense to me. Even though it happened in 2008, I've been thinking about it ever since. I guess I should explain. The 23rd day of September 2008. My home is close to the river and on the border of Gorham and Wyndham, slightly buried in the woods. I had been told by a girlfriend that there were some walking paths into the deeper sections of the woods one horribly boring afternoon. She came over immediately after I asked her to show me because I was curious. We ventured into the woods and took some lovely pictures of the turning leaves and some roving deer. Up until the point where the forest floor dipped very deeply, the walk was lovely. We attempted to descend into it but it was like attempting to climb down a wall. We stood at the top for a while and surveyed the valley below the hill, trying to determine whether it would be worthwhile to stutter down. We explored its perimeter and discovered that it resembled a small ravine. As we continued, we started to notice that the ground was different. Compared to other parts of the forest, it had more rocks. I briefly looked away from my feet as I looked forward and noticed a small cave in the ravine. Water trickled out of it, formed a small river, and traveled about ten to twenty feet before it abruptly vanished. I smiled as I turned to face my friend, whom I'll call Clarice for now. I said we must descend into the cave, indicating it with my finger. She gave a quick nod before taking the lead and moving toward a section of the ravine that appeared to be less steep overall. We soon arrived at the cave after stumbling down it. While I looked into this incredible discovery, Clarice sat down and drank some water from what appeared to be petrified wood. It was wider than I was but shorter than I was when I stood in front of it. Up to my collarbone and about elbow to elbow, the light that entered revealed that the space inside was small, dipped in, and became extremely small. But this, caves, construction out of stacked, plastered stones is what makes it so unusual. I was so excited that I took a few pictures of it. My children would adore seeing this. As I ducked my head and stepped inside, I was thinking. But disappointment became popular. We had been in the woods for hours, and I had no flashlight. I scowled, but I continued to take pictures of the interior despite my expression. It was chilly, wet, and drippy. My spine tingled as a light breeze of chilly air, resembling a tired exhalation, came from the cave and followed an even softer sound. I could hear a tiny, brief hiss above the water dripping. I heard it even though the sound was almost completely silent for that brief second. I turned to face Clarice, backed away from the cave, and took one last picture. She grinned at me and told me about farmers digging tunnels under dilapidated roads to divert wastewater to other uses. It would, according to her, 
explain all of the loose stones above us. I responded with a fake interested nod. However, I wished to enter the cave. I could not explain it, but I was determined to get to the end to admire it and possibly become the first person ever to enter. Although it was exciting, it was quickly growing dark. I turned to Clarice while giddy and suggested we return the following day. She replied that although she had a counseling appointment in Portland, I could go alone. We walked home after leaving the cave, as I promised. When we emerged from the woods, it was completely dark. Clarice hurried to her Ford Explorer, jumping inside with a loud goodbye because she needed to get home in time for her show. I stood in the driveway briefly, waving her off with my hand still up, but my fingers had stopped moving. Her suddenness surprised me, but I didn't dwell on it for long. Just to say, the trip home was uneventful. I only noticed that Clarice remained silent the entire time and exhibited signs of anxiety. I put the pictures on my laptop when I got home and enjoyed looking through them all. Those of the cave and all of its beauty were my favorites. I looked through the pictures until I concluded that I should go to bed if I wanted to leave early. Clarice had mentioned that farmers would dig water caves, and I somehow assumed that was what it was for as my computer shut down. But it seemed to have a deeper meaning, as if it were for something much more significant than just a few stones and some water. I envisioned it as a fantastic hideout where a murder had been committed. The victim's remains still lay there, awaiting discovery. My arms and legs started to get goosebumps, so I rushed to get the phone. If not Clarice, then someone else had to accompany me. I had to tell everyone what I would discover and earn their trust. I called my other friend, the mother of my daughter's close friend, and asked if she was up for a hike. Carol inquired about our destination after consented to her name being used there. The old paths behind my house, I told her. After a lengthy pause, she quietly replied, Sure, and said she would be there tomorrow at 9 a.m. Something reminded me that Clarice had been out of counseling for two years as I lay in bed and stared at my ceiling fan. I thought about this memory and turned to my side to look at the doorway. My bag was lying on its side when I last saw it where I had placed it. I assumed I did it while shutting the door. After that, I quickly fell asleep. I slept without dreaming. Carol arrived a little later than expected, at 9.27, explaining that she had to wait for her husband to get home to watch their youngest son, Aaron, while she was gone due to the flu. At 10.39, we left for the cave, and once more, the journey went without incident. When we arrived at our destination, Carol announced that she wasn't feeling well and would remain on the ravine's crest. However, I descended and dared to enter the cave. In the morning, as I waited for Carol to arrive, I checked and double-checked that I had my camera and flashlight. I threw my backpack aside and removed my headlamp, flashlight, and camera before getting down and dirty. Despite my doubts, I already had my cell phone in my pocket. I could yell and Carol would hear me. I knew it for a fact. I listened intently as I inserted my head into the cave. I only heard water rushing by and a few drops dripping into puddles. I pointed my flashlight into the cave and turned it on. My jaw dropped at the cave's initial appearance. It was small. Very little. However, I could see very far back and could see that it either came to an end or veered sharply to the right. I took a few tentative steps inside the cave before ducking down and starting to crawl. My bones felt like crumpled paper as I crawled because my hands were on slippery, filthy rocks. My legs were spread apart so that I didn't dip my boots into the water, but it felt like I was crouching on my feet. 
To make my way into the cave, I found some dirt mounds and loose stones. Despite the slow and uncomfortable pace, I made it to a dip in the cave before I had to stop. Since I used my hands a lot more than my flashlight to aim, I decided to switch to my headlamp and turn off my flashlight. I could now turn around and see Carol outside along with the trees. About eight or nine feet into the cave, I was. I snapped a few pictures of the plastered stone, slung my camera back around my neck, and then tried to duck under the rock's crevice but discovered that I would have to lay down to fit it. I sat there for a while with my head and part of my hands under the dip. I pondered whether it was worthwhile to risk getting wet. Water was dripping from the floor beneath me. After giving it some thought, I realized I was wearing a windbreaker. I quickly went under after yanking it off and putting it where I would have to crawl. I tried to find a place to set my flashlight and camera so I could move around without being constrained. I held them in front of me. I inserted my flashlight into the small crack in the rock and hung my camera from the light's hilt. I jerked as I felt my back grate against the ceiling and my shirt rip open, exposing my skin. I could sit on the other side after the brief struggle ended in seconds. I took a brief pause, turned, and placed a chance stone on my windbreaker so I could crawl back through when I came back. I grabbed my camera and flashlight and turned back in the direction I had just come. The light coming from under the dip was so dim that I could hardly see it, and if I turned my gaze away, the darkness seemed to engulf me. I raised my level of awkward crouch crawling as I directed my headlamp toward the shadows. Now more nervous than excited, I continued. I had been in the cave for 10 to 15 minutes and descended about 14 feet. It grew more silent as I moved forward. The atmosphere of the forest was lost, along with the sound of the birds. The only sounds I could hear were water trickling, my labored breathing, and the shifting of the sand and stone under my feet. Every time I took a breather, the silence was deafening. A cozy, unpleasant, dense silence that made everything seem weighty. If I hadn't said it already, the cave smelled musty. Like rust and decaying leaves. If rust has a smell at all. But I believe it's the only thing I can use to contrast the metallic odor. I was certain it wasn't blood because it smelled too strongly like blood. My nose was burning from the smell, but it was also good in a really stupid way. Even though you know the unpleasant smells, you still want to smell more. I discovered the cave was getting slightly taller but less wide at about 27 feet. Sometimes, I had to worm my way through and around confined spaces. As a result of all the scrapes and cuts caused by the stones, my back soon started to hurt and throb with a tiny, sharp pain. I was covered in dirt and slime on my hands and knees, but I didn't let it bother me. I approached the cave's turn, and excitement quickly overcame my anxiety. This wasn't a good thing, though. I was energized by excitement and tried to make my way to the turn more quickly but I slipped much more than before. I always managed to catch myself, but I nearly hit a rock with my face in a few close calls. As the cave grew bigger, I could almost stand up. It appeared to be about the same size as the entrance, if not slightly thinner. The turn was in front of me when I had traveled 35 feet. I stood my hand on the corner and took a look all around. I was relieved to be able to stand up as the cave grew significantly. I could see only a small pool of water and a steady stream of water from the roof, which measured about five feet in height. The cave appeared to be about seven or eight feet across, and heaps of stones were stacked in the corners as if by workers on the caves. Though I had my doubts. Hearing the hissing, I raised my camera to take a few pictures. However, 
compared to when I heard it outside the cave, it was much closer and louder. I was terrified because it sounded right behind me. I dropped my camera to my chest, the straps came loose, and I spun around to face the trickling water. The camera smashed into the water with a loud splash, sinking unknowably deep. I stood motionless for a while, carefully focusing on the other side of the room. After a brief moment of looking around, I noticed that I had dropped the camera after hearing my headlamp snap in one direction and then the other. I sank to my knees and threw my hand into the water. I almost reached my shoulder inside but could not feel the bottom. I backed up, using my headlamp to scan the area around the water in an effort to see the bottom. However, nothing was there. I sighed as my own eyes in the water met mine. The sound simply stayed close to my lips without reverberating. There were no echoes in this cave. I glanced behind my left shoulder just as I was about to turn away when I noticed a black shape. I quickly turned, sitting on my rear as my heart leaped. There was only a massive tower of rocks, which I had attempted to photograph. I chuckled nervously before getting to my feet, wiping my hands, and returning my attention to the pool. I bit my lip, relieved that I had brought my digital camera rather than my professional Canon camera from home. However, it was still $60 that was lost at the bottom of what appeared to be an endless pool. But since there was nothing I could do, I turned back the way I had come while growing increasingly anxious as I stared at the cave. After what had transpired, I wasn't sure that I wanted to continue. I seriously considered turning around and walking back forty feet in, in particular that hissing. I stood there and considered whether the hissing was coming from a snake or a bat. It wasn't impossible, but it was almost certainly harmless if a snake existed here. Bats are still present in Maine, just not as frequently as they are elsewhere. Harmless. After adjusting my headlamp, I turned to the path I had not yet traveled on. The next tunnel was just as tall but not as wide as the cave. Or even taller. In comparison to the rest of the cave, the walls were smoother and constructed primarily of lighter stone. The moment I was about to enter this tunnel, the phone in my pocket vibrated. I searched, pulled it out, and shoved it against my ear. Carol was slightly distorted on the other end. You've been gone for almost an hour, I see. Why are you doing that? Although it was difficult to get this far, the distance inside must be around 40 or 45 feet. I moved deeper into the tunnel as I continued to look around. I will proceed past the cave and investigate what lies above it. All right. I'll stay here for now. I paused to hear what she had to say before continuing. Charlie, be careful. That cave might become perplexing. Or worse. Worse? Collapse. The word really hit me. I had not even considered it. I'll take extra care around loose stones and unwinding paths. I said with a chuckle in my voice. Carol sighed instead of laughing back. I'll be in touch soon. Click. I took the phone out of my ear, gave it a long look, and then put it back in my pocket. Moving over a few larger rocks that appeared to have fallen from the ceiling decades ago, I continued. After another thirty minutes of a boring, straight tunnel, I found myself in yet another room with stones stacked around me. This time... There was a strange patch of gravel near the top right corner rather than any water. It was somewhat rounded but still squarish. An old, rusted shovel embedded in the gravel was placed on top of it. I really can't say shovel. It resembled a piece of very rotten, very broken metal with a top handle. There appeared to be an old, plaid hat wrapped around the shovel head. It had a few holes and appeared older and more worn out than the shovel. 
The entire thing was covered in dirt and grime. It appeared to have been set on the shovel handle because of the hole where the shovel passed through. Still, over time, the object rotted to the point where it could not support its weight and fell. I gave it a long look while desperately hoping it wasn't what I had assumed. I hurried to the next tunnel, squeezed in, and left the suggested grave behind without pausing. I quickly turned away from it. The shovel had to have gone 86 feet into the cave. The next tunnel was more difficult to descend than the previous one because the walls appeared missing pieces or were broken. Many more piles of rocks and dirt, and some tools remained. I was growing increasingly anxious and perplexed about what was happening. Clarice claimed that the tunnel was finished, and they had been for at least 200 years. It seemed as though whoever had been working down here had left abruptly and quickly from how things were starting to look. I suddenly remembered the hissing and shadow hiding behind my reflection. I felt scared rather than excited. I hated every second of this place because there was something terribly off about it. But if I went back right now, Carol and the others would see me as a scared little girl who couldn't handle adventure. I wondered how long it would take to reach the next room as I continued down the corridor. If only there was a full one. Before I could walk 100 feet, I thought I heard a shuffling that was only partially masked by my footsteps. I slowed down, turned, and paid close attention. There was silence. My light radiated into the space I had just left, a tiny gap in the horizon. I moved forward and then stopped. The shifting began before ceasing. My stomach jumped, and I spun around and started to run. I ran aimlessly, jumping over obstacles like rocks. I stumbled and dropped my flashlight, not pausing to pick it up. But soon, I was so exhausted that I slowed to a stop and peered over my shoulder to see the shadows following me. My headlamp trembled as I stared at the tunnel as my heart leaped in my chest, and I dashed into the following chamber, slamming my back against the wall. My throat burned as the air rushed so quickly into my lungs. Somewhere along the way, my ears had popped, and now they hurt more than my throat. My stomach was clenched, and I had tears in my eyes. I was terrified extremely terrified. I wasn't this terrified even the one time my daughter didn't return home from the second grade. I was trapped inside this cave with something and was unable to exit. I was confined. When a lump started to form in my throat, I started crying and fell to the ground. I sobbed a lot, coughing and hyperventilating. I screamed in agony occasionally slapping the ground or kicking a loose stone. I decided to try and call Carol after my fit to see if she could help me in any way. Find the tunnel's end, perhaps. Thankfully, the phone was still in my pocket, so I quickly dialed her number. Before she answered, the phone rang four times in a row. Charlie? How are you doing? An hour ago. I returned to the cave entrance. I just started babbling about what was happening despite what she had said over the phone. She remained silent the entire book-length story before muttering. I know. At the conclusion, I froze dead silent. My soft breathing was the only sound that had significantly calmed down. Charlie, I should not have permitted you to enter. I ought not to have. Carol's voice started to tremble. When the tunnel was initially constructed, it was used for the purposes Clarice had stated. Irrigation with water. However, something terrible went wrong. Carol? I began, trying to convince myself that this wasn't real, as anxiety quickly spread through my chest as she continued. The male victim died. He was discovered with his head missing, hands and feet severed, and nobody ever learned how. 
they dug deeper and buried what was left of him there. Charlie, they found something abominable down there. However, it has always only been a story. Something to deter children from exploring the tunnels. Nobody believed it as they grew older because it was just a rumor. Charlie, my God, my God. You can go down there. It's in there with you. I just stood there looking at the floor as she started sobbing loudly on the phone. It all became clear. The alleged grave, the unfinished caverns, and the abandoned tools. Carol, it's all right. Settle down. I'll be all right. There must be another way to leave this place, right? I said, attempting to sound upbeat. I sighed when I heard her hum an affirmative. All right. So I'll just read through to the end and leave. Everything will be fine. Be unconcerned about me. If I have any needs, I'll call. Okay. Please be careful. Finally, she hung up. I sucked in the data as I leaned forward and turned to the new tunnel. Then I shut the phone and put it back in my pocket. As I started moving steadily into the next tunnel, my head was racing, my stomach was in knots, and my heart was racing. At that point, I must have been at least 150 feet down. I traversed many more caverns before coming to a sudden, ragged wall. I spent a long time staring at it in disbelief, wondering if I had somehow accidentally taken another route. But I could not do so because it was directing all the water in one direction. I turned to head back, but as I did so, my light caught a silhouetted figure. Mid-step, my foot froze, and I just continued to look at the figure. It had odd hands with fingers that split in half to become other fingers and appeared human but was hunched over. Although its waist was smaller than my hand, it had a large chest. It had an odd, animal-like face and was staring directly at me. Before the recognizable hissing sound and its disappearing, that was all I could see. It left existence with a blink rather than fleeing or leaping from the light. I remained frozen for at least five minutes, my tongue like sandpaper, before I finally uttered, What the hell was that? My stomach flipped like a trapeze as I licked my lips and sighed shakily. Not in a good way, either. But I moved forward, hoping to find a second tunnel by returning the way I came. I soon reached a fork in the road and turned to go down the other side, moving more quickly than before. I kept having visions of the creature observing me in the shadows. I hadn't seen its eyes. As I quickened my pace, I pondered whether they were red, black, or some other color associated with evil. I pondered whether or not it had pointed teeth. To keep my thoughts from wandering, I counted the number of teeth it had before jogging. Moving footsteps could be heard behind me. Who or what was it? Were they monsters? Even so, was it real? Was I just dreaming or what? As I started to run, I started crying once more. As soon as I heard the hiss, I forced the thoughts away, but it soon turned into an inhuman screech of rage. I started to scream out every time I came close to tripping or falling as I sobbed loudly. As I increased my speed, the colors started to blend, and I ran so quickly that I could hardly distinguish between the floor and the walls. Its approaching loud footsteps increased my desire for a miracle as the thuds got closer and closer. I'm still here because of that today. A wonder. I noticed a light. There was a light though it was dim. I felt the urge to hide behind and flee the darkness as my heart raced. I was running toward the light when I noticed it was coming from a tunnel that curved slightly upwards. As I got close to the entrance, I threw my hands out and threw myself at it. My chest slammed into the gap, and I started to climb. I could hear whatever was behind me growling and hissing in annoyance, so it wasn't far behind. 
I wailed and sobbed as I frantically climbed the hole after spotting the setting sun. I briefly smiled, but it quickly disappeared and was replaced by a pained wince. My pants' knees were torn and dripping with blood, and my hands were cut and bleeding from the rocks. However, I was going to escape from this. A hand immediately grabbed my foot as I was about to throw my hand to the ground. I screamed, and the sound reverberated throughout the forest. Birds dispersed. Shaking my leg, I turned to look below. It was standing there with enormous, glaring red eyes, bared teeth, and a tongue that was gray and lolling out of its mouth. It was dark gray and slick with an unidentified liquid, with pale, hairless skin that sagged and appeared to be the skin of an elderly person. It snapped its jaws and hissed at me. I punched it in the face with my other foot while holding onto it as it writhed and growled. I scratched at the surface above me as I felt dragged back into the tunnels from above. I dropped my hand just in time to catch a rock that had been knocked loose. I looked down at the animal, still staring at me with its enormous, hungry eyes. After raising it above my head, I threw the rock down on the creature. When it released my leg, it let out a strange, not animal, not human roar before tumbling back into the cave. Its head slammed against the floor and I could hear a rumbling sound from the horrifying crack. As the rocks below started to fall, I forced myself out of the cave and quickly turned around to see the creature trying to escape. Shaking my head, I saw a stone drop directly in front of it. A few more minutes of rumbling passed before silence descended. I'm sure I sat there for several hours, merely gazing at the hole that is partially exposed. My leg felt on fire, and my heart was still racing. When I finally came out of my stupor, I looked down at it and saw that the monster had dug its claws through my skin. In my panic, I had completely missed it. Nine bloody lines from the monster's peculiar fingers were visible on my calf. In the middle of the woods, with the sun setting and my leg bleeding, I simply let myself fall to the ground by leaning back. However, I simply lay there and temporarily forgot everything. I was in such total and utter shock that I didn't budge. I was startled out of my shock by a noise. A gentle rustling sound. Sitting up, I took a look around. My phone vibrated in my pocket, and I realized what it was. I slowly removed it spilling blood onto the screen as I picked up the phone and put the speaker to my ear to answer the call. Charlie? Charlie! Since the cave collapsed, I have repeatedly called you. Oh God, Charlie, I thought for sure you were gone. Carol shouted through the line, and I huffed nervously. No, I'm good. I'm in a tunnel's opening. I merely just managed to survive. I said, It's still in there. After pausing, Carol made no comment. After a brief pause, I said, I'm bleeding. My hands and legs have a few cuts. She sighed and told me to stay put while she started looking for me. As usual, she hung up first. I stood up, hobbled over to a tree, sat before it, and leaned against it. Carol didn't come across me and brought me home for another half an hour. We explained that I had a run-in with hungry stray dogs as she drove me to the hospital. I had a rabies test, which came back negative, after which I had stitches and was sent home. Five years have passed since then. My leg has some noticeable scarring. I moved to the other side of the river, and Carol, Clarice and I are still close friends today. After my accident, locals told me about the legend. As Carol had mentioned, some farmers needed to irrigate some land, so they built a tunnel. They started by digging it, which had a few cave-ins, but then lined the walls with stone and plastered it with some ancient tar. 
They discovered something buried deep within their tunnels about halfway through the digging. After opening it, they discovered a chest that contained only an extremely old piece of paper in the hopes of discovering some lost treasure. They attempted to read it, bringing to life something that had probably been dormant there for a long time. They were unaware until the man's head and extremities were discovered. They kept digging before realizing they were being pursued by it. So they dug the shaft where I had fled and never came back. Only four of the seven workers, it is claimed, made it out alive. I have only ever told Clarice and Carol about my incident and never told anyone else. I'll pay well for any useful information if anyone knows about this creature. I discovered a strange forest known as the Devil's Forest by the locals deep within the mountainous valleys of my home state in Romania. In 1998, I came across it on a night hike through the wilderness. In the mood for adventure, I strayed from the usual hiking path. I was nearly lost in the towering pine trees when I came across an old wooden sign that read, The Devil's Forest. I ventured deeper into the woods with caution. In case I truly needed to call for assistance, I had a compass and one of those old emergency satellite phones with me. I continued to walk through the difficult terrain while moving east. For whatever reason, I just kept walking and walking without realizing how far I'd come in. I must have been lost in my thoughts or in some sort of daze. An odd atmosphere hung over me as I moved further into this unsettling setting. Soon it was dark, and a thick fog was coming from a hollow not far away. The mountain was covered in fog, obscuring the spaces between the trees and confusing the terrain. I kept having a strange feeling in my head. Perhaps it was just my paranoia, but I could hear someone behind me following each step I took. I wasn't planning on being there after dark. I made my way forward using nothing but a tiny keychain flashlight from my car keys. The footsteps then increased in volume and speed. Through the fog, I peered behind me, but I could not see anything. I finally decided to turn around and return to this point. The noises followed me even after I turned around and moved westward. As paranoia gripped me, every shadow and shape in my path seemed a potential danger. The gloom echoed waves of its sterile emptiness at me. Then my mind started to play tricks on me. I started to think that maybe a bear or some other animal was making these noises, and once I started thinking that, I couldn't stop. The sound of footsteps seemed to get closer, and I felt more threatened. I erred by running when I suddenly panicked. I launched myself into a full sprint, navigating the trees and the haze as I went. As embarrassing as it is, I truly thought I would die. This place really had an impact on my mental state. Then, as I squeezed between two straggly trees, I was caught by a protruding branch, which caused me to veer to the side and fall backward. I lost my balance completely and fell hard on the forest floor. As the daylight dwindled, I lay there for a while, catching my breath and gazing up into the sky beyond the tall trees. I was practically dead if something was after me. But to my shock, the noise had stopped. Did I outrun it? I questioned. Was it all just in my head? I got up and tried to get myself back on track. But when I looked at my compass, I saw something wasn't right. The compass needle was whirling frantically back and forth. Did it break when it fell, or was it affected by something? Luckily, I could follow some nearby power lines back to safety. My compass strangely started functioning once more as I neared the main trail. I returned to my vehicle just as the stars adorned the night sky. 
I noticed a peculiar light in the sky as I was leaving. Nothing like a plane or anything similar, was it? I'm still unsure what it was, but it shone an eerie purple glow. Although I'm hesitant to use the term, unidentified flying object, it fits that description. I was just eager to get home at this point. I hardly got any rest that night. I simply kept reflecting on my experience. Whenever I closed my eyes, I would see the devil's forest's pine trees, the approaching fog, or the treetops reaching the sky. I would either see a brilliant glowing purple light in the sky or hear the menacing sound of something approaching. In my dream that night, I ran through the pitch-black forest, dodging the large trees in a hasty attempt to escape. What though was pursuing me? I questioned. The dream had felt so real. I could feel the forest floor and the fresh night air, hear the crickets, and sense the danger of something approaching. What did I flee from? I had to return there. There was a force holding me back. It seemed like there was still some of me there. I would go this time, though, in the morning. I would be ready to see something unusual this time. I took my usual route, driving towards the main hiking trail as the tall pine trees on either side of the road scraped the sky. Suddenly, something stirred in a nearby bush. A dense, hairy mass emerged from the vegetation. It sprinted onto the upcoming road. I slammed on my brakes in an instant and narrowly missed hitting it. A human-like figure covered entirely in hair stood there. The creature fled before I could get a good look at it. It vanished into the dense wilderness and vanished forever. My God, what did I just see? I was stunned and confused by what had just happened as I sat in the middle of the street for a while. Maybe it was arrogance, recklessness, or something else that overcame me, but I continued to drive. From there, it would only become more bizarre. I glanced at my watch, which had abruptly stopped. I parked my car at the trailhead and started walking through the forest. I entered the Devil's Forest, once more across the challenging terrain in the direction of the rising sun. The trees appeared aware of my presence, and the forest seemed vibrant and active. Even stranger than before, it felt. The air seemed to be filled with electricity. I was enveloped by the atmosphere, which clung to me like a blanket. Insufferably dense air made breathing difficult. Once more, a thick fog rolled in, obscuring the entire scene. An individual emerged from the fog. I jumped back in awe. In addition to having identification patches on his shoulders and front pocket, he was donning a green forest ranger uniform. What on earth are you doing here? You cannot stray this far from the path. He spoke authoritatively. I'm sorry. Just taking a look around. I muttered fearfully. Although he seemed like a straight shooter, I refrained from telling him about the strange object that ran out in front of my car. He gave me a stern look and said, I'm going to need you to turn around and return to the main trail now. This guy just didn't seem right in some ways. His voice was almost artificial, like a stage actor reading a line. His name tag was blank, and one of the patches on his shoulders was facing the wrong direction wasn't apparent to me until later. As if sensing my observation, his gaze hardened. He commanded, Turn around and return to your car. I distrusted the man but obeyed his instructions to stay out of trouble. I replied, Ah, uh, yes, sir, and started to turn around. As I moved towards the entrance, I heard him say, Keep in mind that you missed everything. Understood? I noticed the man disappear into thin air as I peered back over my shoulder. He didn't just vanish before my eyes. It wasn't just the fog. I continued to trudge back to my car. 
At that point, I realized something was seriously strange and off about this forest. Either this location played tricks on my mind, or the strangest creatures had made it their home. My mind seemed to become clearer as I walked farther and farther away. No way could have occurred. I must have made that up. I told myself there was no way. I had to confirm. I started to return to where the man had been, but a figure emerged after only a few steps. It was a dreadful ghost that looked like a wolf. The creature's body gleamed bright gray, and its eyes had an unsettling diamond brilliance. This strange creature was no common animal. The wolf began to speak in an eerie and uncanny human voice without ever moving its lips. It mumbled, Turn back. The gray wolf advanced a step. I stood there motionless for a while as my anxiety increased. It repeated this time louder, Turn back. I could hear it speaking both in my head and in my ears. Once more, the specter came toward me. I experienced the strongest sense of flight or fight I've ever experienced. It screamed, Turn back! I started running back to the main trail as quickly as I could. I was consumed by a basic, animalistic desire to flee. I hurried to the safety of my car, got inside, and quickly closed the door. As I was leaving the trailhead, something lifted up from beyond the pine trees. It was a winged creature the size of a man, much larger than any bird. The enormous bird flew through the sky with ease. It moved as fluidly through the water as a fish swimming. It had a huge wingspan, and as it swooped lower, I could see it had glowing red eyes and light gray skin. It glared at me from below. The creature started to follow my car as I was driving as if it were seeing me off and making sure I was getting out of there. It briefly circled overhead before taking off and disappearing from view. I sped off and headed home after driving at top speed. Even though I never returned, I still frequently consider that forest. In my nighttime dreams, I continue to see that location. To my surprise, some of my friends had heard of the Devil's Forest when I asked them about it. They related tales of singing and hushed voices guiding them out of the forest. They related tales of eerie glowing objects and mysterious light bursts. They claimed that occasionally, electronics would stop functioning as if there were some interferences. One of my friends claimed that she suddenly experienced an odd urge to leave while she was hiking through the area. The idea that they had to leave the situation suddenly crossing their minds was a recurring theme in their tales. It appeared the forest had a mechanism for keeping people out or alerting them when they shouldn't be there. My other friend who went camping there told me that his tent was back on the main trail when he woke up. The strangest place I've ever been to is the Devil's Forest. The description, haunted, is insufficient. It's a puzzle that draws you in but repels you before you can solve it. Our knowledge of it shines in the distance, but as we get closer, we can no longer see it. It's a location off-limits to reality, and where people aren't permitted. Years later, I felt compelled to share this story because I recently saw a news report about the locale. It was claimed that a sizable fire tore through that forest, destroying everything in its path. I don't have to worry about some moron reading this and going there like I did. Whatever was there has vanished along with its secrets. It's not the only location like this, though. It's not the only place I'm aware of. You need to be conscious of that. On this planet, there are locations where monsters prowl, strange lights shine in the night sky, and where people and animals aren't always what they seem. You just need to know where to look, and if you're like me, occasionally, you'll stumble upon it.